Hey, man. Hey. What you got there? It's just a sequel idea I had. It's turning red too, turning redder. Oh. Yep. You, uh, you, you think we should do it? Eh, give me some time to think first. Tick-tock, tick-tock, tick-tock. Yeah, let's do it. <laughs> wow, I can't believe Finn made a video about Turning Red sequel so close to his original Turning Red video. It's like he unintentionally made a Turning Red sequel of his own. Ha ha ha, lol, rufflecopter, hashtag irony, colon, parenthesis, colon, parenthesis, less than three panda emoji, click below for a free car. Yeah, there's no way I could have stopped my Turning Red discussion after just one video. It's just too much fun to talk about. It's one of those films that gives you something new to consider every time you watch it. How fitting, right? A movie centered around discovering new sides of yourself leaves you with new things to discover every time you view it. But it's true. Heck, I've watched the movie nine times so far and there's still plenty to ponder about. I still haven't decided if more Pixar films should be using this cartoony art style. I still haven't decided where this movie ranks among other Pixar classics. I still haven't decided if Four Town songs are really catchy or really annoying. Uh, 50-50, I guess? And I still haven't decided which face in this film is my favorite. Do I like Maymay going... <laughs> Maymay going... <laughs> Maymay going... <laughs> or Abby? Yeah, just Abby. Any face this girl makes could be put in a museum. However, one thing about Turning Red that I didn't have to ponder for too long was whether or not there should be a sequel. My initial thought was... Eh, I don't think so. How about a sequel to the critically acclaimed and definitive best Pixar movie Turning Red? Nah. As much as I love basking in the glow of Mama Pixar till I shrink into a shriveled up carcass, I'm not the kind to demand sequels from every single thing I enjoy. In my opinion, the best sequels are made when a film actually has loose ends that can be expanded upon in future stories. Underused characters, unexplored origins, potential new dynamics, you know, something to add a fresh hint of spice to a property while still retaining the flavor that we felt for in the first place. Otherwise, you just end up with an uninspired soulless rehash, an insane deviation that could barely be considered a sequel, or a painfully unnecessary entry that kind of ruins what came before. And Pixar is no stranger to this. Need I remind you of past events? Well, let me tell you a story about a man named Toy. His fourth movie sucked. Yep. However, while I wasn't huge on a Turning Red sequel at first, I saw that a lot of my fans were actually pretty hyped for the continued adventures of the four Maceketeers. Heck, even the creator herself seemed to be down for it, saying that they haven't talked about it yet, but there is an invitation at the end for more stories. With so many people seeming interested, I knew there must have been some kind of hidden potential I was missing here. And after some watching and digging and thinking, I think I've got a winning idea here. So in this video, I'll be discussing my concept for a sequel to Turning Red, including what should be carried over from the original, what the general story and characters would be like, and some fun miscellaneous stuff that I'd like to throw in there. I'm not gonna go all loud and write a pitch bible or whatever, these are just some ideas I'd throw out there if I was like guy number 7 on the story production team. As always, these are just my own weird ideas, and if you have any concepts for a possible Turning Red sequel, you can always leave a comment below. But for now, let's see what weird things I would do if I helped to create a Turning Red 2. Onward! Oh, no, 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 not you. You're a different movie entirely. Come on, move along, come on. Shoo, shoo, come on, come on. Okay, there we go. So first off, what are the main ingredients we need for a decent Turning Red sequel? Or a decent sequel in general, for that matter? Well, like I mentioned before, the best sequels specialize in retaining what elements we loved about the original while adding a new unique flavor to the mix to give the sequel its own identity. It could be new locations, maybe a new style, diving into the origins of characters we know and love, putting them in new situations as we see them react and cope and grow, basically the ideal balance between freshness and familiarity. And how exactly would I pull that off? Well, picture this. The entire Lee family, including May, Ming, Best Dad, the Ants, and May's three friends who decide to tag along, all go on a special two-week-long vacation to China. They make it to the country, get all settled in, maybe we get some cute shenanigans with May and her buddies drinking in the local scene, but then Ming shows them all the main reason for wanting to go there in the first place. They're going to visit the actual homeland of Sun Yi and their ancestors, which has apparently been preserved and kept sacred for years. They hike down a long dirt path to this location only to find a massive mountain range covered by a layer of thick mist. And lying just outside the mist is a small rustic looking outpost, run by a man dressed in traditional Chinese garb with a very eloquent way of speaking who throws in the occasional proverb or wise words when it's appropriate. 
basically what you'd expect when you think of ancient China, but not done so much that it's stereotypical. We don't want that. Anyways, within this outpost, there's a whole museum documenting the history of the sacred land. And the family is surprised to find out that the Lees were not the only ones who prayed to the spirits and received supernatural forms. There were many other families who did the same, some gaining the form of a tortoise, or a rat, or an ox, monkey, phoenix, dragon, a veritable zoo of different animal spirits. Even though these ancestors have long since passed, the land they once inhabited is now sacred ground, and it's said that anyone who dares to travel beyond the mist finds nothing but confusion and suffering. Unless, of course, they are modern-day relatives of these ancient families. Then the mist might grant them mercy. May, being very excited about this, eventually shows off her panda form to the curator, and he recognizes this as the mark of the Song Yi dynasty, the mighty red pandas. And he offers them a trip through the mists, which they happily accept. He guides them through effortlessly, everything seems normal, but after almost an hour of traveling, the curator eventually takes off his traditional garb and reveals that he just has normal clothes underneath. He whips out a walkie-talkie, much to everyone's surprise, and just starts talking casually, like, we just got some new folks coming in. <laughs> yeah, Sung Yi's people, can you believe it? <laughs> no, they didn't buy anything from the gift shop, or something like that. And then, once they exit the mist and enter the mountain range, they find the absolute last thing they expected. A fully developed city. Like, not a traditional old-style Chinese village or anything, but a full-on urban living space. Only difference is that this city has multiple families with spiritual animal powers perfectly integrated into society. Like, you can see giant bears constructing skyscrapers, or eagles providing air travel, or water dragons controlling rivers to run hydroelectric generators. A whole self-contained modern society. Kind of like a cross between Onward and Encanto, the more I think about it. The Lees obviously have some questions, and the curator explains that these are all modern-day relatives of animal spirit holders that have been ostracized from society for obvious reasons, so they basically created a safe haven for them with all the modern comforts that they're used to. A place where they can not only be free with their creature-like forms, but also use them to contribute to the community in a variety of ways. Even the facilities and homes were constructed to compensate for them. Like if their animal form is giant, their house would have raised ceilings and bigger roofs. And if their animal form is tiny, they'd have smaller doorways and appliances to use for the time being. Heck, that ancient mist that surrounds the city? That's actually created by dragons. And the reason that no one can make it through the mist is because there are dragons constantly on patrol using wind currents to push them around in different directions. Meaning they'll usually keep going in circles until they eventually collapse from exhaustion and are taken back to the outpost. And the rest of the movie involves the Lees exploring this new society, Mei and her friends having the vacation of a lifetime, and Ming starting to realize that maybe it's not impossible to live with her panda in a modern day setting. Maybe she should actually take it back. You still with me here? You sure? I know there was a lot to take in. Okay, so why do I think this is a good idea? Number one, it's a great opportunity to integrate new aspects of Chinese culture into the film. Animal symbolism in Chinese folklore is freaking everywhere. There are so many creatures that possess symbolic meaning in China even to this very day, and having other families that literally embody these creatures' forms and signature traits would open up so many doors for creative powers. Take the humble tortoise, for example. This guy is one of the four auspicious beasts of Chinese culture, next to dragons, phoenixes, and tigers. It's seen as a symbol of knowledge, perseverance, prosperity, and long life mainly since it's one of the Earth's oldest creatures. I mean, these guys can survive without food for more than a year and evade the majority of common diseases, which led the Chinese to believe that they actually have magical abilities. So if a family decided to pray to the spirit of the tortoise, I imagine that they'd be able to transform into a large, tanky reptile spirit when under extreme emotion, and their signature ability would be hiding inside their enormous shell, essentially creating a large indestructible fallout shelter, which friends, families, and neighbors could huddle in to be protected from natural disasters disasters or advancing enemies. The way that it would preserve lives by protecting them from danger really does go with the concept of long life and perseverance that the animal embodies. You can also incorporate the animals of the Chinese zodiac as well. The rat, for example, being the first sign, is characterized as being very eloquent, hardworking, sociable, and charismatic, but also scheming, ruthless, and manipulative. It's also believed that rats were capable of communicating with God in order to foresee good and bad events that occur like earthquakes, locust plagues, floods, and droughts. They're like the ultimate weathermen. 
It's raining sideways. Sounds rough, Ollie. Do you have an umbrella? Had one. Where is it? Inside out, two miles away. With all this talk of communication, social skills, and manipulation, I could totally see ancient families praying to the rat spirits, shrinking down their bodies to actual rat size, and then using this gift to act as messengers, secretly transferring information to neighboring towns, maybe doing a little infiltration and spy work on certain enemies, and then relaying that info to warn their friends and neighbors. And of course, this small size could help them hide in small, hard to find places in case of emergencies. And of course, you've got the mythical Chinese beasts like dragons, which could do... Well, it's... It's freaking dragons, dude. They do exactly what you think they would do. Okay, all joking aside though, Chinese mythology and symbolism are incredibly fascinating. And I think it would be both really respectful and really interesting if they included these kinds of concepts in a Turning Red sequel. Number two, it would present an interesting perspective that can challenge Ming's notions about concealing her panda form. Hands down, the most commonly suggested sequel idea is a story where Ming and her sisters learn to accept their panda forms instead of outright rejecting them. Seems like a sensible idea on paper, but when you stop and really think about it, this is much easier said than done. I said in my original Turning Red video that the Li women rejecting their panda was a major disrespect to Sun Yi, especially with the lengths she went to to secure the safety of her children and future generations of her family. But looking back, I don't think that's entirely fair. I mean, yeah, hearing them call this gift a mere inconvenience and a challenge is pretty cruel, but I get it now. The world evolves and changes, new standards come around, new standards mean new rules and norms, and yeah, going full on furry fanfic whenever you stub your toe or lose a game of Mario Kart definitely has more caveats than it does benefits. So I can't exactly fault the Lee women for wanting to seal it away in our day and age. So if you did want to go with the whole plotline of the Lee women embracing their pandas, you need to come up with a scenario that could change their minds organically. And the best way to do this is to introduce them to a fresh new perspective. Perspective. Fresh out, I take it. And what could be fresher than a full-on modern society, much like their own, full of people that are able to exist comfortably with their animal gifts simply by making certain living adjustments and arrangements. And in doing so, they're able to better provide for themselves, their families, and their community, helping out in ways that no normal human possibly could. Ming would meet up with different families and see how they live and act and cooperate, showing her more and more examples of how the city was able to thrive. This kind of thing wouldn't change her mind right away, but it would definitely give her pause and make her think, huh, you know, if these people can make it work and be better off for it, maybe I can too. In fact, considering that Mei's main storyline was wrapped up in the first film, you could actually have Ming be the central focus of this film and spend most of the movie with her contemplating what she should do. Heck, if you wanted to add more conflict to her choice, have Ming's four sisters all disagree on whether or not they should let out their own pandas. This isn't just Ming's choice. The four of them have the same dilemma, and it would give the crew a chance to flesh them out more instead of just making them a niece-coddling hive mind like the first movie. And come on, who wouldn't want to see more of the ant squad? This my squad better move aside, boy. This my squad hold us back so high, boy. So yeah, more Chinese culture, Ming in the spotlight, a subversion of the whole hidden city trope. Not bad, right? Definitely sounds like a movie I'd go check out, but what do you guys think? Would you ever want to see a Turning Red sequel? And if so, how would you handle it if you were in charge? Leave your thoughts in the comments below. Thanks for tuning in, everybody, and I hope to see you all real soon.